Hello, welcome to PCAP's Native Prairie Speaker Series. My name is Caitlin Morose, and I am the Stewardship Coordinator with Saskatchewan Prairie Conservation Action Plan, or PCAP. Every month, PCAP asks uh, someone to talk about prairie conservation or species at risk, either in a in-person presentation in a Saskatchewan community or an online webinar. Um, Today, Medea Curtinu with Canadian Wildlife Service will be talking about conservation of Leptoptera species at risk in the prairie provinces. Special with this webinar, it's part of PCAP's fourth annual Prairies Got the Goods Week, and that's a week-long series of webinars about ecological goods and services. And I would like to encourage all of our listeners to check out the PCAP website for information about future webinars, and also a recording of all the past webinars that have been going on this week is available on the PCAP YouTube channel. Um, before we begin, just a little bit of business, I would like to thank our presenting sponsors, Sask Energy, Eco-Friendly Sask, Wildlife Habitat Canada, Saskatchewan Cattlemen's Association, as well as our supporting sponsors, Camp Wolf Willow, Ranchers Stewardship Alliance Inc., Environment and Climate Change Canada. If you have any questions during the webinar, please feel free to type it into the question section of the webinar dashboard at any time during the presentation, and questions will be answered towards the end of the webinar. Now a bit about Medea. Medea has been with Canadian Wildlife Service since 2008 when she graduated from the University of Manitoba with a Master's in Resource Management. Besides working on LEPS, Medea has assisted her CWS colleagues with field work on various species including swift fox, loggerhead shrikes, harvest mouse, piping plovers, waterfowl, and grassland birds. Medea has two young boys that are keen to learn about wildlife and our natural wo world and doing good things for the planet. Medea and her family enjoy backcountry camping, canoeing, fishing, picking berries, cross-country skiing, and exploring. So with that, I'd like to pass it over to Medea. Uh, hi, uh, Caitlin. Uh, hello, everyone. Can you hear me okay, yes. Caitlin? Yep, loud. Okay. <laughs> Perfect. I will speak very close. Um, hello, everybody. Um, I would like to start by thanking Caitlin from PCAP for inviting me um, to present to you today on a topic that perhaps does not get a lot of public attention, and that is our prairie lepidoptera, which um, includes moths and butterflies, and many of which are now declining and becoming more rare. A uh, similar trend seen with many pollinators um, across the, the globe. I believe that um, this week, Graham Parsons from uh, Saskatchewan Agriculture presented to you about bees, so everybody's familiar with pollinators. Um, I also hope that everyone is well and in the comfort of their home and that this presentation is a bit of a break. Um, and I've included some lovely butterfly photos and hopefully after this everybody's eager for spring to come and plant some plants for our, um, our wonderful butterflies. As Caitlin mentioned, my name is Medea Curtano. I'm a species at risk biologist with Environment and Climate Change Canada at the Edmonton office. Uh, I work with recovery biologists to write um, recovery documents for all our species at risk that occur in the Prairie provinces. So that's a big chunk of my work. But I also am the lead recovery planning um, biologist for uh, at risk Lepidoptera in the Prairie region. Um, Medea, we don't see your screen at the moment. Um, oh, I'm so sorry. <sighs> Thank you. How is that? Yes, perfect. There we go. <laughs> okay. <laughs> perfect. Okay, so I'm going to move the screen. Let me know. There it is. Okay. So um, I thought I might start the presentation go over, going over our federal species at risk, um, or SARA, cycle, in case some people might not be familiar, where Environment and Climate Change Canada fits into recovery of species at risk. Um, I will like to, to introduce you to some of our butterflies and moths that are currently listed in SARA and that I'm, um, ha I am or have been working on. Um, just over some threats to that um, are for prairie lepidoptera, some beneficial management practices, Maybe people uh, are wondering, well, what can I do 
I've included some resources and uh, hopefully we'll have some time for questions. So the Species at Risk Act, or SARA, uh, recovery process starts with the assessment of the status of a species. In Canada, the Committee on the Status of Endangered Wildlife in Canada, also known as COSIWIC, conducts a species assessment and recommends a status designation. The assessment is science-based and the proposed status is based on a set of criteria, but the official des decision lies with the cabinet. The assessments are based on the status of wildlife in Canada, regardless of the species' global status. So that's the first box. Um, the next one is listing in SARA. Um, so the goal of SARA is recovering species from imminent extinction extirpation so that they may return to a normal management scenario. SARA contains detailed processes requirements, prescriptive mandatory obligations for ministers, and strict timelines reflecting both the high risk and low margin of error situation the species is in, and the need for urgency. Under SARA, it is expected that provinces and territories take responsibility on managing and recovering species at risk, um, but SARA provides an overarching protection. Federal government responsibilities are for aquatic species, migratory birds, and all species on federal land. So once a species is listed in SARA, then um, we go to the recovery planning, which I highlighted there in orange, and um, that is where my job fits in and um, in respect to Lepidoptera recovery, and I will focus more on this, on what that means for, uh, for um, me in my job and for LEP um, conservation. Um, the next step is um, implementation, and this refers to the initiatives undertaken to recover the species at risk. This could be stewardship initiatives or funding programs such as habitat stewardship program. Uh, stewardship is cooperatively working with landowners, land managers, nonprofit organizations, and other um, agencies in a voluntary manner. Stewardship is a primary tool to be used to protect and enhance habitat for species at risk. The last um, box is evaluation, which refers to the process where under SARA, a species status has to be reassessed every 10 years by COSIWEC. This is where new population and ecological data that has been gathered in the last 10 years is examined and a new assessment is completed. And the cycle continues again. Um, this is the SARA cycle using the Pawashik skipperling as an example. Pawashik skipperling is one of the species I am currently working on. In November 2003, um, the species was assessed for the first time as threatened by Kosiwek. In 2005, the species was listed under SARA as threatened. In 2012, a final recovery strategy with partial, partial critical habitat was finalized and posted on our SARA public registry. Once the recovery strategy has been finalized, implementation begins, um, and this is in the form of stewardship agreements or habitat management funding, as I mentioned. Um, Funding for these activities are linked to the strategies identified in the recovery strategy or to um, areas that have been identified as critical habitat. So as you can see, um, uh, in, uh, over the 10 years, uh, Kosiwe did another reassessment and the species was listed, uh, reassessed as endangered. And in February 2019, the species status was listed, was uplisted to endangered. So under the section 45 of SARA, the competent minister may amend a recovery strategy at any time. After consultation with the Canadian Pawashik Skipperling Recovery Group, it was decided that the amendment of the recovery strategy was um, necessary. And this is where we are now. Um, we're amending the old recovery. So this is where right now uh, a bulk of my work is, um, is working with the Canadian Powership Skipperling Recovery Group and the international um, partnership to amend the recovery strategy. So what does um, recovery planning look like for at-risk Lepidoptera in the Prairie Provinces? As mentioned, um, once a species has been legally listed in the Species at Risk Act, a recovery biologist looks at all the data available in the COSIWIC status report and other outside sources to determine if there is enough information to proceed with developing a recovery document. 
For species that are listed as endangered, threatened, or extirpated, we develop a recovery strategy. And for species that are listed as special concern, we develop a management plan. So, so far for all the le prairie lepidoptera that I have worked on, uh, it was decided that um, detailed population and ecological data was lacking to develop evidence-based population and distribution targets or to identify critical habitats. Thus, we um, have undertaken field surveys to um, add to what was already known. Uh, when field work by our staff has not been feasible, we hire species experts to carry out these surveys. The data collected during these surveys is extremely valuable because most often very little is known about um, our prairie uh, leps. Many species are difficult to identify by the general public, thus only a few observations are generally um, known across the species range. Some species exist at low densities, thus they might not be detected during a single visit. Um, the adult stage uh, can be, uh, which is the easiest uh, stage to identify generally in the field, is often very short, maybe two to three weeks. Um, thus the window to detect the species is narrow and often compounded with unfavorable um, weather conditions can result in negative observations. So for many Lepidoptera species, we know so little about um, their ecology, the flight period, that it makes it them difficult to survey and study them. Um, so I can emphasize the importance of targeted standardized surveys for studying rare Lepidoptera. The data collected, um, we use to develop the recovery document. The data is also used to identify critical habitat for endangered or threatened species as well as recovery measures that can help recover and conserve the species. The development of a recovery document is completed in collaboration with the province, other federal agencies such as Parks Canada, um, Department of Natural Defense and Indigenous Communities, as well as other agencies that are interested in the recovery of the species. A proposed document is posted on the government of Sarah, government, um, it's called SARA Public Registry for a 60-day um, public comment period. So if you're interested in providing comments on any, not just LEPs, um, any species at risk, you are, um, and you are not already part of the mailing list, I highly suggest signing up uh, to be notified when documents become posted. Um, this is an opportunity for the public to provide feedback uh, as we always address all comments received during this period. And I have included the link to uh, the Sarah Public Registry at the end of the presentation. And, um, and those there are just some of the uh, fun field surveys we have uh, undertaken or have hired contractors to do. So um, that was recovery planning in a nutshell. You're welcome to contact me if you have any more information. But I thought I would switch gears and introduce folks to some of our rare and endangered prairie lepidoptera that maybe um, some people are not familiar. So at the moment, um, my, m a huge part of my uh, time is spent on um, this critter here. It is possibly one of the most rare and endangered species in Canada that many people probably have never heard of until uh, the previous slide I had up. Um, so this is the Powashik skipperling, a small brownish-orange butterfly that depends on pristine tall grass prairie and fen habitats. This butterfly could potentially become extinct in our lifetime if significant conservation actions are not undertaken. Under SARA, the Powashik Skipperling is federally listed as endangered in Canada and United States, so that's at the federal level, as well as in the province of Manitoba and some of the states. Um, last year, it was uplisted to critically imperiled by the International Union for Conservation of Nature, also known as um, UCN. Um, Powashik Skipperling has been the conservation focus of a large international partnership that is compromised of many dedicated agencies, both in Canada and US, that are working to stop the species from becoming extinct. In Canada, Powashik Skipperling is found at a single location within Manitoba's Tallgrass Prairie Preserve, where it is associated with wet, mesic native prairie, where larval host plants and nectar sources occur. Um, the species was only discovered in Canada in 1985, thus we know very little about its historical distribution, but we assume that it was much more widely distributed throughout the tall grass 
prairie ecosystem. Um, only 1%, uh, less than 1% of the tall grass prairie remains in North America. Thus, the Pauschik Gipperling has experienced drastic decline in distribution and population across its entire range, uh, and, but most specifically and drastically during the last 10 years. Um, the species has been monitored by Nature Conservancy of Canada and University of Winnipeg since 2010. Um, so the last um, 2019 surveys, um, out of the 25 sites that were surveyed, seven, seven were positive and uh, only 51 individuals were counted. And I have to point out that the 51 could be um, double counted because the, the individuals are not marked and these are repeated surveys at one site, so it could potentially be less individuals than that. Um, so when researchers um, discovered that uh, once viable populations in core protected areas were disappearing, an ex situ Head Start program was started at the Minnesota Zoo, followed by a Cinnaboyan Park Zoo in 2017. The goal of the Head Start program is to augment the wild populations with individuals raised and overwintered at the zoo. So here is a map just to show the drastic uh, decline of uh, the Pauschik Skipperling. This map represents the species historical and current distribution based on collected museum specimens as well as observations. The red circles represent the location where the species is known to occur. As you can see, the species is only hanging on in Manitoba, Michigan, and Wisconsin. Um, and here I put some slides up to show you what the uh, program looks like. The X-T2 Head Start program consists of researchers capturing gravid females in the field and providing them with the larval grasses and nectar sources to allow them to oviposition. Um, the females are released back to the same location after 24 hours. The eggs laid during the period are brought back to the zoo, grazed, and overwintered um, at the zoo to, um, to protect them from the, during that critical stage. The, the last image there, that the, shows the release chambers um, where a potted plant with a pupa attached to the grass is placed in the chamber and checked a couple times per day. Once an adult is observed, the door is opened and um, individuals are allowed to fly away. Uh, next, I thought I would um, introduce you to the Dakota skipper. This is another at-risk grassland obligate butterfly. Um, the Dakota skipper is also a small orange tan butterfly that inhibits pristine tall grass and upland dried mixed grass prairies. The Dakota skipper is currently listed as endangered in Canada and threatened in Manitoba and United States and endangered by the UICN. In Canada, the species occurs within fragmented patches in three population centers. One center is in Saskatchewan around the Souris River and two are in Manitoba around the Interlake region and the Oak Lake region. It has been estimated that at least less than 2% of the Dakota skipper historical habitat likely exists in North America. In Canada, the species has been extirpated from five locations, including the Manitoba, including from the Manitoba Tallgrass Prairie Preserve, where it coexisted with the Pauschik skipperling. Um, a final recovery strategy has been posted on the Sarah Public Registry. However, that is outdated and no critical habitat was identified at the time. Uh, so I'm also working on updating the recovery strategy for this species. In 2019, we had an expert survey for the species. Out of the 43 sites searched, a nine, nine were positive new sites and 25 individuals were observed. And here's um, a map um, that represents the species' historical and current distribution, again, based on collected uh, museum specimens as well as observations. The red circles represent the historical locations, while the green are the current observations. Um, next, uh, these, um, this is the gold ditch gem and the dusky uh, dune moss, which I've worked on um, when I first came to Environment Canada. 
And these two smalls depend on active sand dunes or blowouts um, that occur throughout Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba. Gold edge gem, that's the one on the top corner, is a diurnal moth that is quite easy to observe as individuals generally rest within the disk of the larval host plant, and that's the prairie sunflower. The dusky dune moth, that's the bottom one, um, is a nocturnal moth, although it can be found during the day as well, and the species can be captured using light traps. Both species are listed endangered federally and in the province of Manitoba. Uh, we have not, uh, oh, the distribution um, and abundance of these two species are inherently limited by the currents of open, sparsely vegetated active sand dunes. Um, there are 125 sand dunes occurrences throughout the Canadian Prairie provinces, um, but these actually compromise um, only a small fraction of the total land cover. And even within these sand dunes, the species show microhabitat preferences based on sand dune topography, moisture, sand particles, and plant community. So for the um, gold edge gem, um, it is actually only found where its larval host plant, the prairie sunflower, occurs. Uh, we have not completed any surveys recently um, due to other priority species and budget. But a new COSIWIC status report was completed for the gold edge gem in 2016. And the status of the species was confirmed to still be endangered. Um, for both species, a final recovery strategy with identifying critical habitat was posted on the Sarah Public Registry. So you can find them there if you want to learn more about them. And um, this species is uh, one of my favorites. We also did surveys for it. This is the Wiedemeyer Admiral. It is a large, beautiful, conspicuous black and white butterfly that occurs in Canada, only in the southern corner of Alberta. It can be easily confused with the more common and widely distributed white admiral. Um, that's the one in, on the bottom there on the uh, left side. Um, the major difference being that Wiedemeyer Admiral hindwing underside is white, where the white admiral is dark to red to black. Sorry, dark red or black. The um, two species can hybridize where their range is overlap. Um, under Sarah and in the province of Alberta, it is listed as special concern. Uh, the Wiedemeyer Admiral uh, in, uh, is found in riparian and coolies. Um, around the tributaries of the Milk River. Last surveys completed by Canadian Wildlife Service staff were in 2016, and uh, we have not completed any more surveys. Uh, final management plan um, is on the Sierra Public Registry. Um, so what I wanted to show you with this map is some of the work we did. Um, the first map shows the known uh, distribution of, Wied of Wiedemeyer Admiral in Canada in 2006. 13, um, where two population centers were, uh, were uh, known. Um, so CWS staff surveyed um, for two consecutive years, focusing in the area and between the two population centers, and recorded several other populations, confirming that the two population centers were connected. So we were able to, based on our, our, our surveys, we were able to um, find a bigger distribution and also that their individuals uh, were probably moving among those two population centers. So that was, uh, that was a good uh, uh, surveys. <laughs> um, there's so many species at risk in the prairies. Um, I just threw this, this slide um, because there, there are so many. We have the, in Alberta, we have three species of um, yucca moths that are only associated with the soapy plants. So we, uh, we have a recovery strategy for those with critical habitat identified. We have the vernus flower moth in the bottom there. Uh, we have, of course, the monarch butterfly, which um, is currently listed as special concern, but it has been uh, recently assessed by Kosiwek as endangered. So pretty soon uh, we will be working on a recovery strategy for that. Um, yeah, so there are a lot of uh, Lepidoptera that are um, at risk in the prairie provinces. Um, so why are so many Lepidoptera and pollinators at risk 
in the last 20 years, we have seen a decline in pollinators, not just in Canada, but worldwide. Identification of the specific stressors or threats impacting the decline can be complex and full of uncertainty for recovery biologists. Um, however, a number of factors are suspected to be contributing to the decline in insect pollinator populations in Canada. I, um, I threw them all here. They're all very specific to each species, but these are kind of general. And of course, the direct um, habitat loss is generally identified for most species. This is a historical threat, which has reduced our native prairies. However, um, the small and isolated patches of native prairies that still exist uh, um, are, remain at risk, especially uh, as a result of new political directions or as other land managed becomes more profitable. So maintaining large tracts of native prairies and connecting the isolated patches uh, would be the most significant contributor to conserving Lepidoptera and all pollinators. Uh, succession uh, has been identified as a significant threat for several Lepidoptera species. For example, due to lack of fires or bison grazing, the tall grass prairie, where power sheep skipperling is found, is experiencing native shrub and tree encroachment, resulting in smaller patches of open prairie, thus, um, thus less larval and host plants available to individuals. As these patches become closed in, dispersal becomes restricted, as individual power sheep skipperlings have been found not to fly through shrub or tree fence. Um, thus, um, they become isolated uh, local populations, reducing reproduction opportunities as mates might not be able to find each other. Um, the other succession also happens for gold edge gem and uh, dusky dune moth, who are um, depending on active sand dunes. Um, and the succession could be from um, just native plants stabilizing the, the sand dunes. And um, this is partly due to um, limited fires or uh, that and bison grazing that uh, has changed uh, management. Um, on the other end, uh, fires, either wild or prescribed, can be a threat to small and isolated populations. Um, and, but research has shown that butterfly richness and abundance um, can increase after a time of burn. Um, Invasive species, again, it reduces, uh, it can change the, the plant community, reducing larval host plants, uh, such as milkweed or, um, yeah. Uh, severe uh, overgrazing by cattle or deer is also seen as a threat. Again, uh, the eggs or larvae can be consumed by, um, by cattle or deer, um, and at the same time, trampling of, of the plants and uh, cons consuming the flowering plants. Pesticide application, uh, especially air application, is, uh, is a threat. Uh, it can have direct mortality on both adults and other life stages. Um, yeah, I've already mentioned alteration of, and suppression of natural fire regimes um, because that results in succession um, of uh, for both power sheep skipperling and for uh, gold bitch gem. Severe events related to climate change, um, and that is, um, it can be as, uh, you know, flooding or resulting in insynchronized host plants flower flowering with adult emergence and larval development um, occurring at different stages, uh, and that can also have a, a significant impact on Lepidoptera. Um, I thought I would discuss a little bit some of the me beneficial management practices. Again, these are, um, they would have to be specific to that species and specific to that area that is being managed since different species might require different things. So these are very general. Um, of course, conserving native prairie and any natural land is, uh, is the most important thing that we can do for these uh, species and, and maintaining the biodiversity that comes with these, um, with these lands. Um, no, do not use pesticides, area, area spring to control pest species. Again, this has a direct <coughs> impact, uh, causing direct mortality for uh, different um, life stages, especially the larval stage could be um, impacted. Uh, 
Um, but yeah, if you already have land and you have native grass, well, you're already contributing so much by having these um, highly endangered ecosystems. So maintaining it, I think, is the most important thing. Um, but also inventorying what's on that land. We know so little about Lepidoptera. There's so many, there's so few people that can identify these, um, the, the species down to the species level that inventorying these lands before they disappear is incredibly important. Um, it's hard for us to have access to private lands. So um, yeah, if you have private lands and want to know what's on them, I highly suggest you to, to do an inventory and, and um, be surprised how many species of um, Lepidoptera are probably there. Yeah, uh, marginal land, I think it's, it's I think it's always seen as unproductive land that needs to be changed, but um, a lot of the time these marginal lands have um, are high biodiversity and can be left uh, alone uh, and provide flowering plants um, and shrubs for, for different species. Uh, yeah, for mon monarchs, I think everybody's familiar um, that they need milkweed, so consider planting milkweeds or leave them where they are, um, as, uh, as these are important flowering um, nectar uh, sources for monarchs. Um, li to limit and not mow certain areas, like ditches, right of the ways, um, these are great um, habitats for, for um, Lepidoptera because of the different species of flowering plants that they need, um, even just for migrating or dispersing through different habitats. Um, it's been found that fall mowing is beneficial to maintain more flowering plants for adults. Um, again, it's, it's providing those nectar sources for the adults to complete their life cycle. So if you don't have um, private land or if you're not uh, managing a native prairie, uh, what can you do? Um, well, I think all landowners and naturalists and gardeners can create butterfly habitat uh, with native um, plant species at home, at school, work, and within the community. Um, the other thing you can do is to become a citizen scientist. Um, people can also report sightings of all butterfly species um, at many citizen science websites, and I provided um, a link in the resource uh, slide. Um, but yes, please make sure you take a picture. Everybody has a cell phone, um, because um, on all these websites there are uh, many uh, experts, and they will be able to um, identify the species for you. Um, of course, you um, can always donate, um, and that money can go to purchasing rangeland for research, um, and also can volunteer. And I've included some links for, especially for the Powishik Skipperling, they're always looking for um, um, ways to raise money, um, either for research or for um, the captive, uh, for the zoo program. Um, I didn't want to end on a, on a depressing note, so I thought I would uh, share uh, a good news story. Uh, this is an interesting um, species I've had the privilege to work on. Um, this is the weenie borer. It's a brown, inconspicuous, nocturnal stem borer moth, previously known in Canada only from one location in Manitoba and two locations in Ontario. The species is currently listed federally as endangered in Canada and in Ontario. It had not been observed in Manitoba since 1905, where it was first discovered in a weenie, um, and from Ontario in 2005. The, at the time, the species was be believed to um, be associated with sandy uh, prairie or active sand dunes. In 2002, uh, 15, Kyle Johnson from um, University of Wisconsin um, with a group of um, other researchers, um, they discovered a population right on the Minnesota-Manitoba border. The team also identified the species larval host plant and concluded that the species um, habitat is not sandy um, prairie but actually fens. 
So over the next couple of years, Kyle, contracted by Environment and Climate Change Canada, was able to locate new populations, um, also from the historical site, which hadn't been seen since 1905, but as well as from Saskatchewan and across other sites in Manitoba. So the map on there shows the, the new locations in yellow of the um, new occurrences. Um, all this data is currently being um, added into a new Klesiewicz status report and will be used to reassess the species and maybe, who knows, downlisted to a lower risk level. So um, I guess with that, I just wanted to say how important it is to, um, to have on the ground targeted surveys because if um, initially very little is known about species, uh, about Lepidoptera in particular when we first list them. And um, so having targeted surveys and just learning more about their distribution and population and ecology um, can, can mean a lot um, to, the, to what is already known about the species. So um, I'm super glad to, to see that we were able to, to discover the species in other regions of the country. So it's a feel good story. Uh, and I, here I've included some of um, the resources. Like I said, the first one is the Species at Risk Public Registry. Any um, recovery strategy that we work on um, is posted there. And every time um, a document is being um, posted as proposed, which means that the public has an opportunity to uh, comment on it, is being posted there and they will notify you. I included the provincial data centers because any observation of a Lepidoptera, either at risk or rare, uh, should be um, should be uh, sent to them because, as a recovery biologist, we always go to the provincial data center to obtain all our data once we start. And the Kustiwik status report writers, they all go to there to obtain data. So I can't say enough um, for the importance of these provincial data centers. Um, to deposit um, all observations. Um, there are many citizen science uh, websites. The, the one that I'm familiar with is the, for the monarchs, is Journey North. And for all other species, there is iNaturalist. And yeah, they're, they're great. We also go there. It's not as, um, uh, we don't rely as much for it if we don't know the actual coordinates, but they're definitely a, a good place to get an idea of where species are distributed and, and the number of observations. In particular to PowerSeq, um, I can't stress enough the fact that it is one of our most uh, endangered species right now. Um, I've included some really cool videos uh, about the, the, what people are doing in Canada and United States. A great group of people are, are, are working very hard uh, to recover the species. So, um, I highly encourage you to, to watch these videos. Um, they're, um, yeah, they're having lots of um, donate uh, fund me pro um, events, so um, please look at those as well if you feel like this is something you can do. And we also have some, we, Assiniboine Zoo has a, a website where you can buy some merchandise with a cute power shake skipper link on it. And with that, I think uh, I'm done. Um, I have, if you have any questions, I put up my contact uh, email address if you have any questions um, regarding this presentation, but also um, if you have some observations that you want to share, some cool things, especially the species that I've talked about today. I'm always interested in, in um, I collect all their observations, all the data. So if you have some cool stuff to share, I'd be happy to. Um, to hear. So I hope that covers um, uh, everything. Like I don't know, I didn't go into too much detail um, because I wasn't sure uh, if there was enough time or if um, it might just be a bit too too much. I just thought introducing uh, everybody to some Lepidoptera would be a, a good break in our in our day. So yeah, Caitlin, I can um, I can answer any questions. 
Cool. Thank you so much, Medea, uh, for the really interesting presentation. And I'll be the first to admit that I, um, before this, knew very little about butterflies. So um, it's really nice to have a name and um, a little bit more information about each of the species. So um, I know you've um, had a really busy week <laughs> with everything going on. And so um, I really want to say a special thank you for um, sharing your wealth of, of knowledge and expertise with us today. Um, we have uh, quite a few questions coming in from listeners. Um, a lizard named Milana would like to know if you have any recommendations for a butterfly ID field guide. Hmm. Um, there's many books. I guess it depends because each province actually does have its own, um, their own butterfly books. Okay. So, yeah, no, not, uh, not particularly. Like I said, most of the time I, we have the species that we work on, we go in and we just kind of focus on those species and if we think that we can identify them then we um, we hire species experts but yeah usually I just use what the the whatever the provincial document is okay is there a picture for that document um, well I'm uh, well it's like the butterflies of Manitoba um, by Klassen that's a good one for Manitoba um, and for Alberta, I can't remember which one I used. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Um, do you ever use something like iNaturalist um, to identify um, any insects or butterflies? No, no. I only go there just to see where that species is. Okay. Um, so, for example, um, we were interested in seeing the distribution of um, molehill duskywing, which is found in Manitoba. So I went in there to see if anybody else has provided any other uh, observations. The thing with iNaturalist, if it is identified as a species at risk, they will not include uh, a GPS location. And for us, we need that. So uh, it's not the best place to get the, the information that I need for recovery planning, but it, it does give me an idea. Like I said, I think, if you do have observations of species, the best place to deposit them is with data centers. Okay, excellent, thank you. Uh, we have a couple questions about um, habitat. Um, do you know how much of the habitat loss is um, contributed to uh, agricultural conversion or drainage? Yeah, so I mean, with, with tall grass prairie, that's probably one of the most, um, endangered ecosystem we have probably less than um one percent available and all that has to do with with loss of of um, habitat to conversion of uh to crops um you know the tall grass prairie was very fertile um so what is left right now it's actually sort of the um the soil the the zones that were might have not been um seen as productive at the time so um from literature yeah it's for the tall grass prairie is less than 1% and for the mixed grass prairie is like probably less than 2% left. And a lot of it has to do with conversion to crop. Um, and also probably uh, in there, I think it's included the um, habitat that is used for um, forage production, so hay. Um, is there an opportunity to expand habitat, habitat by returning? Sorry, I can't, he just broke up. Oh, sorry. Is there opportunity to expand habitat by returning some lands um, back to grassland species? Well, I'm always a positive thinker, and I think you can. Um, from what I've seen in um, in literature and different presentations, I think Saskatchewan has a great uh, restoration conference year, um, an annual conference. From my understanding, it is uh, difficult to to get back that. Um, diverse ecosystem and also I think there is some shortage of native seeds um, however I think where there is a will there is a way and I think if there's more demand on um, on restoring na uh, crops or, or fields into native prairie I think there is um, there is a way I mean it's better than nothing so um, I think the, the most important thing let's not convert it let's keep what we have but if you do have some um, some fields that you do want to convert, um, I think 
I think it is a possibility. And I know there's lots of people, lots of researchers who have done research on this. Uh, a lot of publications, I can even send that way, um, that have shown um, success. It takes a while with Native Prairie, um, but I, I think it can be done. Um, do you know if Environment and Climate Change Canada has any um, policies being developed to facilitate um, like habitat expansion or uh, prairie restoration? I am not the best person to ask for that. I am more of like the science research kind of field work kind of person, but we do have lots of staff who work on that sort of stewardship program. Um, and I'm not sure, um, each, each project gets its own sort of um, value of, um, if they're going to get funded. Um, so I, I'm sorry, I can't really answer. No problem. Which, That's okay. Yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> um, uh, Lisa Ross would like to know if you, uh, you mentioned about getting engaged for an inventory. Um, like he says, he's interested in doing an inventory. So I guess what are the next steps? Um, like doing an inventory on a person's land for species at risk. He he wants to do an inventory of his land. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's something that you. Well, he can he can contact us and and we can definitely um help him out. Um. Yeah. Um. We'd love to to see more landowners sort of reach out and, and see if we can, if they do. I guess the first part would be to see where the land is, that if it's native prairie and what kind of, um, where he's at. Um, and, um, and, you know, maybe even just mapping the location where the land is, we can see what species might be there as well. But definitely reach out and, and we can talk about it. Thank you. Um, there's a couple questions about invasive species. Um, a listener named Doreen would like to know if you've um, contacted like the rail companies regarding uh, right of ways and weed suppression or anything like that. No, no, we don't. Um, so in my particular job, we don't um, work hand on hand with industry to to get these um, these recovery actions completed. Um, most of the time, like for, for in my field anyways, for Lepidoptera, like we, we do these surveys and we, we um, collect the data to write these uh, recovery documents. Um, and then the implementation um, part where you would reach out uh, to them. I We don't do that. Um, I. Yeah, I don't know how you would um, make railroad companies stop yeah. what they're doing without um, some kind of higher up policy. Yeah. But I personally have not reached out to uh, to to the industry to stop what they're doing. Okay. I think that's yeah, and that's probably it's like some kind of enforcement. Um, um, component as well and what we do in environment canada is we also are um for the critical habitat that's identified so railroads uh wouldn't necessarily fall within that okay thanks for that answer <laughs> um a listener named daniel says that he has a small patch of grasslands on his farm but it has leafy spurge um so he's done spraying to control the spurge to allow native plants to grow um but you said not to spray pesticides um and he's wondering if you meant um not to spray insecticides oh sorry did i say pesticides yeah so i mean even pesticides can have impact on 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 the the plants or the flowering plants but um it specifically yes i meant insecticides and especially aerial serving i think applying um in controlled areas um is is okay i mean following um the directions in on the for the chemical um yeah, I I haven't dealt with with leafy spurge myself, so I don't know. Depending on how um, how big the area is, um, but um, yeah, I guess yeah. Over time, I guess even pulling it out, I don't know how big the area is. Pulling it out 
uh, even maybe mowing it once, it might help um, to sort of bring it back to, um, to its natural state as well. Uh, I know there's tons of um, organizations that work with that that can provide lots of important, because I mean, that's what, what they do, um, that can provide, provide direct um, advice on how to deal with that particular uh, situation. Uh, but yeah, I meant insecticides and especially like aerial large, large uh, scale spraying that happens on uh, crop fields um, or for pest outbreaks. Um, I, yeah, it's just, it's, it's a threat. And I guess it depends also which species you have on your, on your property as well, especially, uh, yeah, if you had a, a species at risk, I'd be more concerned um, to, to be very careful with the spraying. But if it's, you know, if it's sort of spot spraying, especially for an invasive species, um, then it's probably okay I'm following the regulations on the bottle of the chemical. Okay, thanks for that answer. Um, a listener named Peter um, is inquiring about identification and says that the adult phase appears to be um, the best of the three stages for identifying the species and is wondering if there's a best time of year to be most aware of, of butterfly presence. Sorry, can you repeat the last part? Um, is there what a year? Best time of year to be aware of butterfly presence. Oh, well, each butterfly has its own um, flight period. So um, I think pretty much come spring, you know, there's butterflies that overwinter as adults. So you would see them as adults, like right away, um, where others will, will be um, overwintering as pupa and then will, you know, uh, sorry, they'll overwinter as, as larva. So they will take a lot more time to um, develop and they'll, uh, emerge in later summer. So no, there isn't. There isn't one. I mean, I I think most sort of peak probably is is in summer when all the the flowering plants are in bloom. Um, but each species has its own cycle. So you will see species um, throughout the year, throughout the spring to even fall. So if there's any particular species he's interested in, he would have to look at the at a field guide to see but um, yeah I, I think it's it's any sort of um, midsummer when all the plants are in bloom for because of they, they need this nectar source um, it would be the best bet but luckily we can see butterflies even early in spring <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome <laughs> sounds like they're each unique <laughs> they are a uh, listener named Ryan would like to know if, um, if you know of, uh, if there are any plans to assess other potential prairie species or risk that are rare or declining or grassland obligates, um, such as that Pahaska skipper, Bois Duval's blue, um, the burr oak specialist, um, juveniles and sleepy dusky wings. Um, is there any plans? Yeah, to assess to them as a to assess them. I just saw three different prairie species that are being um, assessed right now. We were just looking at sending out information. Um, but I'm not usually, Kasiwik is in charge of that. Um, they're the ones who decide which species they're going to be looking at. So as a concerned citizen, if you, if you think there is a species that um, you have, um, you know, used to see it's all the time in this particular area, but now it's declining and you have no idea it hasn't been converted to a crop field and you know you just know what's going on, then um, I definitely uh, suggest you can reach out to them and, and, um, and request that a, a status assessment be done. I have no power over what species are being assessed. Um, our job um, here is once they get listed, then we, we dive in to just find out more about them and complete those um, recovery documents and identify critical habitat and identify recovery actions and things like that. So um, I, yeah, I don't know which species are coming down the pipe and usually those are um, decided by Kusiwak. Uh, 
Okay, thanks for that answer. Um, we have a couple of listeners who are interested in um, milkweed in Saskatchewan in particular. Um, it um, it seems to be that it may not be natural in some areas. So, um, for example, uh, listeners Chris and Peter are wondering, um, how do you manage for uh, species such as the monarch butterfly um, when milkweed is, you know, they don't grow in uh, riparian areas. It may not be natural to some places in Saskatchewan. Yeah, so we haven't dove into all the complexities of, of monarch and milkweed uh, from, um, you know, previous, um, it was considered a special concern species. So we're just kind of um, making sure that it's not uh, going to decline, but that's not the case. Um, so we found that the populations are declining. Um, so we haven't dove in into the details of what it means and how we can um, recover the species. Um, I think um, most people, most researchers and citizen science have promoted the planting of milkweed. Um, I'm not familiar with the species that are in um, that are in Saskatchewan. Um, so I would um, not be planting them further north than the species distrib distribution, um, since that might promote the species from um, going north and then not surviving. So um, definitely, yeah, not to plant any kind of milkweed. Um, and yeah, I, I know that milkweed can be considered, um, I think, kind of toxic for cattle. So if there are areas where there is no cattle and um, there are some areas that can be left fields that are left um, alone and, and, and um, as well as ditches and right of the ways, I think those are all potential um, habitats um, that can be used. Again, like I said, we have not um, dove in into sort of what needs to be done um, to recover the species. Uh, once it's listed as endangered, but um, definitely not to introduce species that are not, do not buy the seed packs or something that come from <laughs> mail order uh, and start spreading it, you know, wherever. Um, and I would contact, yeah, other organizations who, uh, who deal with native plants and, and ask for advice if you do want to create uh, a native um, monarch garden. Thanks for that. I'm not sure if that answers the question. Yeah, it does. <laughs> it's a complicated one. Um, Alyssa yeah. Brianna has written in um, and would like to suggest uh, need to plant solutions as a resource for restoration for um, for people who are interested in that. Um, a listener named Aaron would like to know um, if there's you know such a thing as alternate host plants that could be available for some of these uh, butterflies at risk. Is that a thing? Do they have host plants or alternate host plants? <laughs> um, um, well, anything is possible uh, because, like I said, a lot of these species haven't been studied very, very uh, detailed. But for some of them, we we know, like for the prairie, uh, for the gold edge stem, um, they're just associated with with that. There's not that many flowering plants, and they found them in the in, right inside of the disc of the um, prairie sunflower. Um, yeah, monarch, I think, has been quite well studied. Um, so, but anything is possible. I mean, you know, some of these species, you know, there hasn't been a lot of masters or PhDs um, studying them. So, uh, I'm not, I'm, I've learned my lesson never say never because. You know, nature is very complex and, and um, you know, who knows, maybe with climate change and species will need to, to change host plants and it's kind of, you kind of hope for that, that they're flexible enough. But I think that's kind of why they're, they're declining because some of these species are so specific to their larval host plant yeah. that, um, there is no, that if that plant is not there, but maybe other, other micro habitats. Um, components are there, but if the larval host plant is not there, they have nothing to to survive on. So, yeah. 
Thanks for that answer. Um, a listener named Julia is wondering about um, when insect biosurveys are taken, um, for example, you know, swooping with a net. Um, she's wondering if the insects are killed um, or which ones are collected um, for the bio blitz and count IDs. Are they are they swooped um, or or how does so if you're, they're asking if there's mortality while they're doing the, so I've never been part of a bio blitz, but I think in most circumstances when they do survey for species with a net, um, the nets are, you know, like their mesh and a researcher, um, you know, the, the point is not to, to destroy the animal. So, um, yeah, for most part, most of the, the, the researchers do catch the individuals in the net and it's one at a time not a whole bunch of them and um usually they're just kind of either they can identify them through the through the net or um they will put them in a glass jar and look at them that way until they're uh, identified um some some researchers do collect everything and and um they bring them back to the lab and that's like for really like taxonomic surveys where they 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 look at everything and some species are very difficult to identify um, on the wing or in, in even in hand so they will have to do genitalial um, dissection to actually identify the species so for most part there's a lot of insects um, and um, I think lots of people might have question of that um, that if people should do that um, I feel that we know so little about these species that um, it's important to have these experts be able to to have the the individuals on hand and and be able to identify them and look at the records. I mean, we know you know if we didn't have those museum specimens um, or people or specimens in people's collection, we would never know the distribution of some of these species. So yeah, so I think it's important to have um, some individuals to be collected, but for rare individuals. Or species at risk, um, they're always let go or photographed. So uh, even for, for example, for our surveys for the dusky dune moth, where we're using light traps, um, we are actually using non-invasive survey methods where we actually put in egg cartons um, and um, or foams like from the like a mattress foam, and we put those in in our light traps. So in the morning, we came first thing in the morning and we released everything once we identified we just let go everything so there are ways to to do it non-invasively thanks for that answer um and one listener has written in about or several listeners sorry about um the email listing information about master plans and um the public consultation period so thanks for letting us know about um about that process um, and that looks like all the questions that we have right now. And I know we're we're tight on time. <laughs> we have another webinar about um, cattle and methane emissions uh, going on at 1.30 in Saskatchewan and Alberta time. Um, so I guess with that, I really want to sincerely thank you, Medea, for um, for working so hard on this presentation and sharing your your passion of um, of LEPS with us. So uh, thank you so much. To all of our listeners out there, thank you so much for tuning in. This webinar has been recorded and it will be uploaded and available on the PCAP YouTube channel in the near future. And um, when you leave this webinar, a quick one minute survey will pop up. And if you don't mind answering it, it'll help us keep our webinars going in the future. So with that, thank you very much, everyone. And uh, there's lots of comments coming in right now, Medea um, saying thank you. For <laughs> so um, thank you and happy Friday, everyone. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much for the opportunity and hope everybody's out going to go out there and plant some plants, native plants in their garden. This yes, spring. I am. It's Take care. Fabulous. I'm just waiting for the snow. <laughs> I think gardening is uh, so, so, social distancing activity, right? <laughs> for sure. And so is uh, walking in nature and photographing butterflies. Oh, yes. I didn't think about photographing butterflies. <laughs> That's a good one. Take care. You too. Bye. Bye.